All right, I'm gonna go through all the solutions on the review to help you out. All right, first thing, you want to memorize these rules, so they're gonna be really helpful. All right, this first one, uh, we'll do some constructions Monday, but uh, to make a perpendicular that would go through the that would go through this particular point right here what you can do is you can take your compass and you put a little mark there and a mark there again putting a sharp part right there on the P and then the next step would be to move your compass to these where these little arcs are and then you put a mark here and here from from there so, um, hopefully on Monday when we take a look at the constructions, you'll be able to get that a little bit better. All right, on this one, uh, the way that these lines here are going to be parallel is because these, if 5 and 16 are congruent, because there's a theorem that says if the alternate exterior angles are congruent, then you have parallel lines. All right, we're going to practice these marks, too, on Monday, but you put your pointy guy here at the vertex of the angle, and you make an arc, and then you move your compass to where your mark is, and then you put a mark, and you move it over to this one, you put a mark, and then you just draw it straight through. That's an awesome angle bisector. Okay, it's a good idea to memorize when you reflect across the x-axis that the y-coordinate changes. So that's the rule there. Uh, D is the one. Um, you can also just kind of check it out and see, you know, if you have a point right here and you know that it reflects across the x-axis, you know it would be the exact same distance over on this side. And if you look at, if you think about the coordinates, they would be just the opposite sign, you know, instead of 5, negative 1 it would be 5, positive 1, and so you can say, oh yeah, I can see the x's stay the same, but the y changes. This is a nice little proof, so you just kind of run through what they give, and so, you know, they say that BA is congruent to BC, so that's marked up, and then they say that angle 1 and angle 2 are congruent because it's an angle bisector, and then we know that we've got that side in the middle that's shared, so that would be a side angle side congruency. This one, that you can tell these are medians because they're marked up like this, so that means they're the same distance on either side, so this is the midpoint, so midpoint. So median goes from the vertex of a triangle to the midpoint of the opposite side. So that's a median right there. So you can tell the three medians meet up and it's called the centroid. If this is a parallelogram, then we know the opposite angles are congruent. So that's one thing that's definitely true. So we can set them equal to solve for x. If we go from this parallelogram to, or quadrilateral actually, to this one, we can just kind of focus on a particular point and we can say, okay, from A to A prime, it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, so six to the left and then down three. So with these coordinate rules, the X is first, so X minus six and then Y minus three. You can tell this triangle here, if you want to figure out how to get from the pre-image to the image, you can rotate this 180 degrees about the origin. So hopefully you can just picture that rotated 180 degrees. And what happens rule-wise, you know, with your coordinates is that x, y becomes negative x and negative y. So if you do memorize your rules, you'll be able to figure that out, you know, point by point here, coordinates. 
This point here is 1, 1. This one would be negative 1, negative 1. Make sure you're real good with slopes and being able to write equations of lines. So this one, the slope is 4. You can tell it's right in front of the x. And there's your point. So we just use the point-slope form. So y minus, y minus a negative 3 equals the slope, which goes right here, 4. And then parentheses x minus whatever the x-coordinate is, which is 1. And then the double negative you know, creates that y plus 3. Okay, similar here, we take this equation and we have to put it into slope-intercept form so you can see the work there. And then once we do, we can tell that the slope is 2 fifths. So then we flip it and change the sign. That's what the slope would be of the perpendicular line. And then we use the point they gave us and we use the point-slope form again. And so we get y minus the 2 equals negative 5 halves, parentheses, x plus 6, because it's, you know, the x minus a negative 6. Then we distribute, and we get negative 5 halves x, and then when you multiply negative 5 halves times 6, that gives you negative 15. And then you add the 2 to both sides, and you get negative 13. Hopefully you can do that fraction work there. You know, that's negative 5 halves times 6, or 6 over 1. 2 cancels with the 6, so that's 3. That's where we get the negative 15. Okay, perimeter means you need to just add up all the, the side lengths of the outside of the polygon. So you can count the number of units. This is 9 units, and you can count this one. This is 12 units. If it doesn't have really good coordinates on there, as far as like, you know, um, then what you can do is you can take the x coordinate. It's 8. How I can get 12 is I can do 8 minus a negative 4, and that's 12. So it's the right minus the left. These are x coordinates. Then if you want to find the 9, you could do 5. It's uh, this length here is 5 minus a negative 4, and that gets you 9. And then we use the, the Pythagorean theorem to get this length. Anything that's a diagonal, we can use the Pythagorean theorem. So 9 squared plus 12 squared equals c squared. And then you can see the rest of the work there. Take the square root, so we get 15, and then we just add up those lengths. Get 36 for the perimeter. Perpendicular lines, we're just looking for opposite reciprocal slopes, and you can see them there, 3 and negative 1 third. Okay, this one we just, we know that angle 6 is 32, so then that means that angle 5 is, it's a linear pair, so they have to add up to be 180. So 180 minus 32 is 148, and then angle 5 is 148, so so is angle 4. These two are alternate interior angles, so they're equal. So they both are 148, so we add them together, and we get 296. Okay, we're looking for this one, the triangle that would be that rule, and again, that rule is the 180 degree rotation about the origin, so that's clearly C. Okay, here we're looking for the perimeter again, so we can figure out lengths. You know, the 7 here is not too bad just to count, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And because it's a parallelogram, we can immediately say the other side, the opposite side, is 7. And then to get the other length, we can just make a little right triangle out of this. And you can tell this is 3, this is 4. And then you can use the Pythagorean theorem. And you can do 3 squared plus 4 squared equals c squared. Or in this case, you just know 3, 4, 5 Pythagorean triple would work as well. So it's going to be 5. And then we just add up the outsides. So 5 plus 5 plus 7 plus 7 is 24. So I should circle that. 24. 
Okay, this time we're looking for area. So these are both diagonal, you know, lengths. We need this length and we need this length. So we make a little right triangle out of it. And you can see I've got the three and the four there and that gives me five again for the length. Then this one turns out to be six and eight. So we can do the Pythagorean theorem and we get 10 for that length. You know, that would be six squared plus eight squared equals c squared. When you do the work on that, you get 36 plus 64 equals c squared. c squared is 100, so c is 10. So then we use the area formula, and it's one half times the base. So the base would be, you know, either of the sides could be the base and the height but 10 could be the base, and then the height would be five, so we get 25. And anytime you have a right triangle, <coughs> excuse me, the, <coughs> the legs are the base and height. <coughs> Let me see if I can pause this for one sec. Okay, so next one we have, what do we have? We got a rectangle, so we need to find these lengths. So again, you kind of draw a little right triangle and you can see you've got four and four there. So use the Pythagorean theorem. I've got the work shown here. Once you get the radical 32, then you try to find the other length and you can tell that one is seven and seven when you draw your little right triangle to find this length. And that's square root of 98. So then you just multiply them together because it's just base times height for, you know, for rectangles and parallelograms and so when you multiply them you get 31 36 and you can that's under the radical and that's a perfect square so make sure you know how to do that on your calculator and you get 56. okay this is a parallelogram so we're just looking for you know the things that would be true so we would say that a is congruent to c they're opposite angles they're congruent. Uh, we also have consecutive angles that are what we call supplementary. So they're just right next to each other. We have uh, BC is congruent to AD. So again, opposite angles or opposite sides are congruent. And then we have AB is parallel to CD because opposite sides are, are parallel. I might have said that wrong, sorry. Okay, so we're looking at just finding angle measures. So we start off with the one that's given, so 128. So we know this one's 128 because it's a vertical angle. Then we know this one is 128 because it's alternate interior angle. We know this one is 128 because it's a vertical angle. And we know this one's 52 because it's a linear pair. It forms a straight line. So. 180 minus 128 is 52 and then you just kind of figure out which ones are correct All right, so drop down same kind of angle angle relationships with parallel lines So 1 and 8 are considered alternate exterior angles, so they are congruent. So that's why we'd pick those two things We're looking for a pair of angles that we could use the angle side angle uh, congruence. So you can tell this little mark here, this little mark here is the same. Then we have a side that's in between. And then we have this weird little angle mark that's the same as this weird little angle mark. So we have angle side angle there. Okay, we're trying to figure out which, uh, what would the equation be if it was, let's see, we want it to be perpendicular, it says perpendicular, uh, and we want it to go through that point. So we can kind of look at the slope here and we can see this one's two thirds, so we want ours to be perpendicular, so we flip it and change the sign. And then we just use the point slope form and you can see the work there. We just, you know, distribute that negative three halves when we're done. And so, yep, so, and then you add the two. So let me know if you need help on any of that algebra work. 
Same thing here with the special angle relationships, all the same, you know, we've got the vertical angles, we got the linear, linear pair, we got the alternate interior angles are congruent vertical angles, so, and then we're able to answer the question, so let's see, so any of them different, oh, some, just make sure you know you're adding, so 6 and 7, we add them together, 65 plus 65 to get the 130, and then 3 and 5, 3 and 5 are considered uh, same side supplement, or same side interior angles, so they're supplementary, and that's why they equal 180. Okay, this is kind of a diagram. It's a parallelogram. So again, uh, we know what's true about parallelograms. We know that we have uh, angle A and C are congruent, so they're both 50. And then we know that consecutive angles are supplementary, so we've seen that a couple times. So that's how we know that we've got angle B would have to be 130, because it's just right next to it. And then we know that if this is 20, so is the side across from it, also 20. Okay, this is a, kind of a big proof to show, there are a couple of them in the review that, to show why when you add up the angles of a triangle that they add up to be 180, it's a proof. So just kind of run through the, you know, make sure you read through this proof and everything. So I don't know how much I'll, you know, describe it in detail, but... First thing you do is you kind of just draw a line that's parallel to uh, AB. So let's say these two are parallel. And then we've got uh, PCB. So that's this angle um, plus angle 5. So we've got this big angle and we got this angle. When you add them together, it equals 180. So that's angle addition postulate. Then we have PCB, so let's see. So that is the whole line. So that's this whole line, PCB. It says that it's equal to four plus two. Oops, sorry, I messed that up. So PCB is actually not the whole line. PCB is this, again, same, the green. And so it says that that's four plus two, which that makes sense, because four plus two is right there. And so that's angle addition postulate. And then we see in the, in the reason it says substitution. So we're like, okay, what, what could we possibly be substituting here? So what we can substitute is we can say, instead of the PCB right here, we could put what it equals. It equals four plus two. So we put uh, measure of angle four plus measure of angle two plus the plus the five and then that would equal 180 so it's a substitution property so look for something that you can obviously substitute that's equivalent you know that equals okay and then i probably won't run through the rest of that proof for a time okay this one we want to write an equation that's parallel so we got one half and then we're going to use that point and then we're just going to do the point slope form uh, like we've done before and then oh it looks like i put two on the same i don't know if i meant to do that um, but four and five those are definitely alternate interior angles oh, then i made them a little bigger so angle four and five right there they're always congruent if the lines are parallel. Okay, how do we know what the relationship is between the lines? Well, it's hard to tell with the equations the way they are. So we have to put them into slope-intercept form. Oops. we got to put them into slope-intercept form first. And then once we do, we'll be able to compare the slopes a lot better. So then we can tell they're both two. So, yeah, see me if you're not able to kind of get them into y equals mx plus b form. Okay, what's the relationship between these two? Well, we have to use the slope formula and calculate the slope first. And when we do, we subtract the y's over the x's. So the order doesn't matter too much. You just have to be really consistent with your, with your coordinates. So I did 7 minus a negative 1 on the top. And then I did 2 minus 1 on the bottom. So I got 8 for this one. 
And then for the other one, I got uh, 1 over negative 8, and those are opposite reciprocals, so then we can be confident that the lines are perpendicular. Okay, we want to write an equation that goes through that point, and it's perpendicular to the line containing these points. So we calculate the slope, and we figure out, oh, it's negative uh, 3. But we want to flip it and change the sign, so that means the slope we want is 1 third. And then we just use the point slope form again. And we get, when you simplify it a little bit, that's the answer you get. Okay, when we go from the pre-image to the image, uh, you can tell that this is a, a rotation. That's what would do the trick. So that would be, looks like uh, maybe like a 100, 180 degree rotation. All right, so good. All right, so lots of equations I picked in here. So this one is... Um, parallel, so we've got the slope we'll take out of this, and then we just use the point, and we just use point slope form. So I think we've kind of talked about that one enough, so we're probably good there. Okay, and this is another alternate interior angles being congruent, so T has to be 95. Okay, same thing uh, as another one we did. So we're looking for uh, what's up with these lines. So is it parallel? And so we um, would just subtract the y's on top over the x's and we find out, yep, they both have a slope of one. So we would say the slopes are the same. So it's the only one I think that has the slopes that are the same, and the y-intercepts are different. Let's see, no, that doesn't make sense. I mean, it wouldn't be no because the slopes are the same. So, yeah, parallel, just look for slopes that are the same. All right, perpendicular lines, they, when they meet, they form a right angle. Definition of an angle is when we have two rays, these are two rays here, and they meet, uh, or they have a common endpoint right here, that creates that angle. And a line segment are all the points um, between and including two given points. So that's a line segment. If you want to go to the right, six units, you're going to add six, and then you're going to go two down. If you want to reflect across the x-axis, again, that rule is just changing the sign of the, the y-coordinate. So... <clears throat> so this one, excuse me, is a decent challenge. So you're trying to figure out, uh, let's see, we're trying to get what the original, that what the pre-image is. So we have the image, but we're trying to find the pre-image. So, and we're trying to use, we're, they said that they use this rule. So x plus 8 and y minus 3. So we're going to have to work backwards. So instead of adding 8, we're going to subtract 8. So I just kind of focused on, you know, one of the coordinates. So I focused on the u prime. So if you go back 8, that means you'd go left 8. So you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then you would go, instead of going down 3, you'd go up 3. And then that would put you right where I have the u there, the original u, before it was, um, before it was moved, translated. And so the coordinates you can see are negative 1, comma 6. And you could do all three coordinates to kind of verify, but you might look maybe at the answers and see if you can save yourself a bit of time. And then you'd be confident that was a good answer. 
Okay, two column proof, you kind of run through the proof here. We've got parallelogram, we've got the diagonal constructed, we have uh, it, some parallel lines going on there, so this is the third step. So AD, so I kind of marked it up, got all these parallel, you know, line segments. And then because of those, because of those parallel, you know, segments, that means that we've got some special relationships with the alternate interior angles. So that's why this angle is congruent to this one. These two angles are congruent. And then, of course, we'll have our side that's shared, you know, that will be congruent as well. And because of all that information, we're able to prove the triangle is congruent by angle side angle. And then after the triangles are congruent, then you can start addressing like, okay, now the triangles are congruent. Now we can go ahead and prove some things about the sides, like, hey, this side's congruent to this side, this side's congruent to this side, because we know all the corresponding parts are congruent, you know, whenever the triangles are congruent. So we have a little, you know, uh, acronym CPCTC for that. Always remember that's after the triangles are congruent. Okay, we're trying to figure out what things might uh, be utilized, you know, to prove that angle B would be congruent to angle C. And that's going to be something that, you know, we would again try to prove the triangles are congruent. And then we'd say, hey, all the parts are congruent, so therefore, you know, angle B would be congruent to angle C. So some of the things that could be included are the ones that I have circled, you know, that BM is congruent to CM and AB would be congruent uh, to AC, because they, they told us that. Didn't they tell us? Yeah, they told us that, because they said it was an isosceles triangle. And then we would be able to say this side in the middle is congruent as well, because it's reflexive, you know, that side is congruent to itself. And we'd be able to show the triangles are congruent by side, side, side. And then we would uh, be able to say that angle B would be congruent to angle C uh, because of CPCTC. Kind of like the last one, we would be able to say that after the fact, after they're congruent. We wouldn't be able to use side angle sides, so that's why that one wouldn't be part of the property. And then the symmetric property wasn't. This is more of a reflexive property, not symmetric. Okay, for this one, I mean, you can kind of look at this one and tell that uh, the reason why uh, angle, look at step three and try to come up with a good reason. So angle three and angle five, you can tell those are alternate interior angles. And they were saying that, you know, it was, these were parallel lines because we had AB was congruent to CD. So, so D is a good choice for that one. Okay, this one, we're looking, again, you can kind of focus on the reason, you know, for step two, why would, why would you say that angle, the measure of angle uh, eight is the same as the measure of angle six, and you can tell they're right across from each other, so they're vertical angles, and we know those are congruent. Okay, I thought patty paper helped a lot on this one, if there's a way you could you know, get yourself to do that a little bit with the computer. It's still kind of possible. So on this one, if you rotate this triangle one 90 degrees, I kind of drew, you know, what the picture of it would look like. Then you'd have to figure out a way that it could land on top of the triangle two. So if you thought about kind of a line being somewhere right in the middle between those two, then you can reflect it right over that line. And so you can kind of count the units. So you go from negative four to two, and that's a total of you know six units. So right in between that, that would be three units. So when you go from negative four, you go three units to the right, that would put you right at negative one. So that's the halfway point, because it has to reflect you know halfway there. So that equation, whenever you have a vertical line, the equation of a vertical line is x equals. So that would be x equals negative 1. So this is a good, you know, choice that would actually work. Uh, 
Okay, if you're trying to figure out, you know, what could possibly be the triangle sum theorem, you know that that is the theorem that says that when you add up the three angles of a triangle that it equals 180. So that's kind of a good clue that, you know, that's the one that you're going to be looking at. None of the other ones really say anything about three angles adding up to be 180. Okay, when you work yourself through this proof and you start marking up everything, you can tell when you when you mark up everything that you've got three sides that are congruent and so the way these uh, triangles would be congruent would be side 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 because we'd have three sides so that's why D is a good choice so just kind of try to mark up your diagram or at least mentally mark it up Okay, which of these are correct? So if we were solving this, we would go ahead and set the opposite angles equal to each other and solve for x. And when you do that, then you can start finding your values. So for angle A, after you figure out that it's 16, then you can start plugging it in. So you can put in a 16 for the x and you get four times 16 plus 11. So that's 75 degrees. And then, so that's the measure of angle A. And then we know that angle D is just right next to it. So we know that that has to be supplementary. So that has to be, you know, um, 180 minus 75. So that would be 105. Okay, a bunch of your normal angle measures again. So if we have line A is parallel to line B, then we know that 4 is congruent, 6 is congruent, 8 is congruent, because we have the vertical angles, then we have alternate interior angles, and then we have vertical angles again. Uh, let's see what we've got here. Okay, so we have parallelogram. So we would want to set the opposite sides equal, equal to each other. They're congruent. So we have, uh, sorry, I lost my brain for a second. So we have these guys we set equal to each other. That's what this equation is. Then we have this one equal to this one. So just setting the opposite sides equal to each other. Okay, and this one we know that if it's a rectangle that rectangles have diagonals that bisect of course all parallelograms have diagonals that bisect each other but with rectangles it's special because the diagonals are congruent so it gave us some lengths so jn was x plus 3 so we know this side would be x plus 3 as well and then it told us jl so it gave this whole length so that means we can add up, you know, x plus 3 plus x plus 3 and set it equal to the whole length. The whole length was 3x plus 1, and that helps a lot, you know, to solve for x. So we do the algebra work here. So again, see me if you have, you know, questions on the algebra work, x plus x, 2x uh, plus the 6, and then... You subtract the 2x from each side, so you get x is 5, and then you just you have to make sure you start finding basically all these measurements, all these lengths, so make sure you plug it in. I was a little quick the first time because I just started thinking that jn was 5, and it's not because you got to plug the 5 in for the x to get the length of jn. So just make sure you always don't just go with x, but make sure you find the values, the lengths of things by plugging it in. Okay, what's true about parallelograms? So we're looking for things that are always true about parallelograms. They don't always have four right angles. That's if it's a rectangle or if it's a square, but the diagonals bisect each other, the opposite sides are congruent, and the opposite angles are congruent. The diagonals don't have to intersect at right angles. If they do, then it would be a rhombus or it would be a square. Or, it could be a kite, um, but that would be, that's not a parallelogram. All right, the thing you need to know about this one is that these two angles, these are the 
uh, remote interior angles, those are going to be equal in measure to the exterior angle. So you add those two together and you set it equal to the exterior angle. That's what this equation here is. Solve for x. When you solve for x, you're really going to have to find basically every angle measure to get this one right. So you got to plug it in and you even need to find this angle measure. So, and you're going to be able to get that one, of course, if you, if you find the other two, then you can do 180 minus those two to get this one. Or if you find this one, you can, you know, do 180 as well, because it's a linear pair. So I'll trust you're good on that one. Okay, uh, looks like basically same thing. So add up. Oh, not entirely. So this one's uh, isosceles, so that means the base angles are congruent. So this one's 5x plus 7, that means this one has to be 5x plus 7, so that helps a lot. And then we can add up the three angles of the triangle and set it equal to 180. And then we just solve for x, so we get x equals 13. And then we can start plugging it in to each of those angle measures to find each of these angle measures and then look for you know two of them make sure you always pay attention to what it says here it should tell you like two that are correct or three that apply something like that so try to follow that detail okay this is a triangle mid segment so a couple of things are true about it so we have parallel we know this length is half of this length uh, We've got some corresponding angles that are in the mix sometimes. So we're just looking for things that are true. So in this case, what's true is that we've got parallel. DE parallel to AC. Okay, we're looking for a perimeter because we're trying to put a fence around this. So you can really just count. So I counted this, I got 14 units there. Counted that straight edge, I got 11. Counted that one, got 13. Then the diagonal, you have to create the little right triangle so you can use the Pythagorean theorem. So two units this way, 14 down. Set up the Pythagorean theorem to find that diagonal. So the diagonal should be, turns out to be 200. And you can simplify the square root of 200 a little bit. So 200 is the square root of 100 times the square root of 2. And you can take the square root of 100, which is 10. So 10 square root of 2, that's where we get that. And then we add up the other three sides. And when you add them together, you can add the numbers. So that's 38. And then you just have to leave the 10 radical 2 the way it is. Okay, this one's a nice proof. Uh, we're trying to show, you know, the triangles are congruent, or we're trying to see if this quadrilateral is a parallelogram. So we've got, um, you know, of course have the first thing they say is that it's given that we've got opposite sides are congruent, so that helps. And then we know the shared side is congruent, so that would be, if we wanted to put that in there, we could put reflexive property in there. And then the triangles are gonna be congruent because it would be side, side, side. And then because, uh, let's see, because the triangles are congruent, we would be able to say that all the parts are congruent, so the angles would be congruent. So STR would be this angle and this angle. And then STR and URT, I should say. And then the other one is SRT, which would be this angle, is congruent to UTR, which would be this angle. And they're congruent because of CPCTC. And then we also have um, parallel. But the reason why we have parallel, the reason why we have these segments are parallel is not because it's a parallelogram, because we haven't proved that yet. It, they're parallel because of that property that says that when the angles are congruent, that that the lines are 
parallel. So remember that if alternate interior angles are congruent, then that means the lines are parallel. And so that's why uh, for step three and four, they are what they have here. So we got side, 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 and we got CPCTC. Okay, we're looking for a perimeter here, so we just count. So we got six and six, and then the diagonal, we can create a little right triangle here. So that's three and four, and then again, we can say it's a special Pythagorean triple to get the five, and then we can just add up all those sides to get 22. Okay, hopefully the constructions we work on Monday a little bit, you'll be able to pick out, you know, which one of these is which. And same thing for this one, just another construction to recognize. So you could do, let's see, you start with your point here and just do mark, mark, and then put your point here and put a mark, mark, and then you can draw a line straight through. So that would be perpendicular. Actually, actually I'll, let, I'll let you practice that one on Monday. You can figure that one out. All right, so for this one, let's see what we got. We got which one, which statement would be not part of the proof if we wanted to do this one. So we have perpendicular. So that's the mark we have here. We got XB is congruent to XC. And let's see what wouldn't be. We would, we would be saying that this side is congruent to itself using the reflexive property. So we're probably going to do like a side angle side on this to prove they're congruent. We wouldn't be able to do side, side, side just because we don't have enough information. We don't have anything about that third side. Everything else looks good. These ones. All right, so for this one, we would be able to do side angle side by utilizing the vertical angles being congruent. And just make sure you know how to read a congruent statement. So remember how everything has to match up. So J goes with the P, K goes with the Q, L goes with the R, and then if they're listed, you know, like they are here, angle J with the P. So that should be easy to, you know, correspond the angles with each other. Okay, what happens when you have the midpoint, you have the triangle mid segment here, is that it creates, these are parallel, and so then it creates these corresponding angles that would be congruent. So that's FHI, which is that one, and FEG, which is that one. Make sure you know the, the middle letter is the vertex of the angle. And similar to that, the mid segment is always one half of the length of that bottom side. So that would be nine. the slope of the line that would be parallel. So just put that into slope intercept form and then you can tell clearly what the slope is. All right, so. Okay, so the congruent statement helps a little bit here because I can see that angle C should be the same as F. So that's 97, that should be 97. I can tell the B has to be the same as the E. So that means that's 22, that's 22. And we're looking for E, D, F. So we know that that's going to be 180 minus the other two. So 180 minus 97 minus 22 just leaves you with 61. 
Okay, you don't really have to plot the points on this one. You just have to know if it's reflecting across the y-axis. Uh, what happens is the x-coordinates change. So instead of negative 5, 5, it just turns into positive 5, 5. Instead of 2, comma 0, it's negative 2, comma 0. Instead of uh, negative 2, negative 4, it's 2, negative 4. So again, that rule would look like this. So probably nice to have that rule memorized. And same rule. All right. And 90 degrees uh, about the origin clockwise. So you can memorize that rule, or you can try to draw it out and try to figure it out. Um, but it would be, uh, we started off at negative 6, negative 5. And so then when you do the, the proper rule, you get negative 5, 6. Okay, so another one of these ones. So parallel to the given line. You have to figure out the slope of the given line, so you can go down 2 and over 3, so that means the slope is negative 2 thirds. Again, that's rise over run. So then you use that slope and the point, and you just put it in point slope form, and then you do a good job of distributing, and then adding that 3 over. Okay, this one, let's see, so reflected over the y-axis, so it would go this way, and then it would go, oops, JK, it would go this way first, and then it would go this way. So if you ever want to reflect it over the y-axis and then the x-axis, it turns out to be the same thing as reflecting it, uh, or rotating it 180 degrees about the origin. As you can kind of tell when you reflect it over the y-axis it changes this coordinate and then when you change it when you reflect it over the x-axis it changes that coordinate so that's why it turns out to be equivalent all right so this one uh, the trapezoid well on this graph will be reflected over the y-axis what would give you the same thing so if you reflect it over the y-axis, it would look like this, this trapezoid, what I have in there in the purple. The other thing that could do it is if you reflected it over the line x equals 4. So if you can picture this, um, this trapezoid would look uh, a little bit different. So it would look more like that when it's reflected over that line. And then you would still have to move it over. You'd still have to move it over eight units that way. So that's why. And you can tell, you can start it here and you can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There. All right. And angle one is congruent to angle two. Those are corresponding angles. Um, so that's what D says. It says if you have two lines that are intersected by a transversal, which is that line there, and a pair of corresponding angles are congruent, then the lines are parallel. And which statement? proves that angle 3 is congruent to 7, so same corresponding angles. Okay, if we want to prove these triangles are congruent using the HL, then we're going to need a hypotenuse and we're going to need a leg. So right now we would be able to say the side that they're sharing would be congruent, so that would be considered a leg. So we would need a hypotenuse. So we would need, you know, this length for each of them. So we need hypotenuse, which would be AC would be congruent to BD. All right, this one, we take that triangle and then we rotate it 90 degrees uh, counterclockwise. 
So if we do the rule on that one, we would get this. I actually used a little patty paper to figure it out. So I got this when I rotated it 90 degrees uh, counterclockwise. So, and then when I reflected it over the y-axis, then I changed the I changed the x coordinate and made it positive. So four comma negative nine is the the result. Okay, so it'll help if you uh, memorize those rules because if you do a ninety degree counterclockwise, let's see what that rule will be now. X Y would be it would be what the opposite of Y and then comma X. All right. All right, uh, what reason could be used to prove those triangles are congruent? So Z is the midpoint of X, Y, so that means that these two little segments would be congruent. Of course, they're sharing the side, and then it looks like it's marked up, so it has a right angle there. So we've got enough information to show side angle side. Right? Right. Okay, so this one, which pair of triangles can be used? Can we do side angle side? So I would say find all the missing angles first so you can decide. So after you do, you can see that you've got... Um, how did I pick that one? How in the world? Let's see. I don't know why I picked that one. Let's see. I got 109, but those aren't even the same side lengths. That is not right. Let's see. What else do I got here? Mm -hmm. Oh, booger. Oh, booger. Looks like I need my calculator to find some measurements here. I got... Um, that is not oh darn I have to come back to this one let's see because I want oh I know what's messing me up this is a bad problem this is similarity so we don't we're not even doing similarity we're doing that in the spring wow so, scratch that one, okay. All right, 82. Uh, let's see what we got here. We, got, we just basically start marking this baby up. It's all marked up. And so then it says, what can we use to justify statement three? So statement three is just showing LTM. So that's, you know, these, this angle. And then QTP, which is this angle, and those are just vertical angles, so they're congruent. All right, so we mark up what we got, which theorem could be used to prove these triangles congruent. So we got PQ, mark, mark, PS, mark. We got the shared side, mark. So side, side, side would do the trick. All right, what must be true according to this congruence statement? So look for true things. So SPR is the one I ended up picking, angle SPR. So again, the way you could do this, you go uh, SPR, so that would be this angle would be congruent to QPR, that'd be that angle. If you're unsure as to whether those should be congruent, then you can use the congruence statement. So you got S, and then you got P, and then R, and then you have go in that same order, and you do Q, P, R. See how it starts in the middle, and then it goes to the left, and then finally to the right. All right, so we kind of did... 
a little bit of one of these already, so I'm going to... I think I might bypass this one. So angle 1 and angle 4, see that is angle addition postulate. We got XPQ adding with the 5, that creates a linear pair. And then we have the 4 is congruent to 2, so we have this one's congruent to this one. If these are parallel, that would they would be alternate interior angles. So, all right. So, what's the length of x, y? So we know that if these are congruent, we can just set them equal to each other. So that's what I did here. So I got x equals nine, and then if you're looking for the length of x, y, we know it's the same as x, w because they have a little tick mark on there too. So you can find it by just plugging it in right there. So we got 9 plus 1, so we got 10. So 10 it is. Almost done. This one you can just start filling in, filling in the proof according to what it says here. We got a parallelogram. So we got angle 1 is congruent to angle 2, so we can mark that. Then, because it's a parallelogram, we could say some other things like AB is congruent to DC, opposite, opposite sides are congruent. B is congruent to D because we know that opposite angles are congruent. And then we would have enough information to prove the triangles are congruent by angle, side, angle. And then we can say things about the, the corresponding parts. So we could say, hey, we, now we know that BX would be congruent to DY, and that would be because of CPCTC. Again, very similar. We prove the triangle is congruent. This is kind of a weird one where the triangle is congruent to itself when you sort of, you know, reflect it. Um, so... No big deal, but big thing to notice is that the order of this is messed up because they have the CPCTC like before the triangles were even proved congruent. So that's what needs to be fixed. We need to put the triangles congruent first, then you can start saying things about the corresponding parts. And I think finally, if you ever see anything about substitution, then try to really look closely and try to figure out, you know, look at the lines previous and see if there's a way you can see any particular, you know, substitution happening. So for this one, you can do a little bit of uh, substitution uh, for that line five because S S and T are given as Q and P, you know, same measures. So you can replace the measures of T and S with the measures of Q and P in these two spots. And that's what that part is. Just this is exactly replaced with angle P and angle Q. And then that kind of helps further in the proof. Because then you can subtract out the measure of angle P and angle Q from each side and that leaves you with just this, the measure of angle R and the measure of angle V. And then, of course, if the measures are the same, then the angles are actually congruent because of the definition of congruency. And I think that's it. So good luck. That is long, but good luck. You got this.